Okay, that, that rounds out the food portion. <clears throat> now we're going to talk a little bit about um, insulin management. So you do something to manage your meal plan that most people are not familiar with. Most people when they're diagnosed are given rapid acting insulin and huge uh, amounts of carbohydrate uh, food suggestions from their dietitians. And so uh, when they read your book or they talk to someone following your plan, they've never even heard of what we call an R or regular insulin. So can you talk about the importance of using R in your meal plan and your in your plan to get normal blood sugars? Okay, type 1 diabetics, for the most part, at least in the USA, are using basal bolus insulin regimens. Uh, this means that they have a long-acting insulin that they take twice a day to cover the fasting state. If they're not eating, they still need a little bit of insulin all day long, and that's the, that's the basal insulin. To cover the glucose that comes in from meals, they need uh, rapid-acting insulin. And there are several different classes of rapid-acting insulin with different action profiles. The slowest of these is regular insulin, which is true human insulin that's diluted 25-fold. And uh, it starts typically, uh, for the average person, it starts working about 40 minutes after an injection and continues working for 8 to 10 hours. But most of its action is during the first 4 or 5 hours. Now, if you're on a low-carbohydrate diet, this is just the timing you need for your insulin. Uh, this is, you're matching the digestion of the carbohydrate and protein that you're eating. If you're on uh, a very high carbohydrate diet, as the professional diabetes associations and endocrine associations recommend, then uh, the logical thing is to take a faster acting insulin. The faster acting insulins uh, are called Novolog and Umolog. And there's another that's sort of uh, uh, a little bit slower than those called Apidra. Now, in theory, these would work great, but the trouble is that these insulins have a sharp peak and high carbohydrate foods, rapid acting carbohydrates have a sharp peak. And you're expected to match those two peaks in time. A near impossibility. Mm -hmm. um, uh, using the term near, is even exaggerating because it's a true impossibility because the people who do this never match. They always go too high or too low after meals and then they go too high or too low later on. Right. Uh, so it's impossible to make this kind of match where you're trying to take two peaks and match them. Right. What we're doing with regular insulin, low carbohydrate and protein is taking a shallow hill, yes. two shallow hills like this, and attempting to match them. And if you're a little bit off, you're not going to make a huge mistake. So your timing uh, may be a little off, but you get, uh, if it's off today, tomorrow, you can adjust it by five minutes or so, and that might put you right on because you're just matching up two shallow hills. It's a very physics-based argument you're making. So even if these parents, uh, I see a lot of discussion where a parent will be obsessed with a cupcake if it has 42 or 45 or 41 grams of, of carbohydrate. If only they could get the carb count correct. You're saying that carb counting doesn't work because of this analogy about these envelopes overlapping. Right, right. You're, 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 you're dealing with mystical things when you think that being precise on counting carbohydrate is going to make up for the fact that you're trying to match a sharp peak with a sharp peak from insulin. It's not going to work. It's impossible. Sometimes you'll and go... Here we have, 
Here we have the insulin makers, the doctors, the dietitians, all pretending that the impossible not only is possible, but it's working every day. And that all these people with the, rap high, with the rapidly varying blood sugars are well controlled. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do I use R? If, I have, so, uh, if I'm lucky enough to convince my endocrinologist to give me a prescription of R, by the way, R is available over the counter. Right, um, and it's in, in, in many states. I think it's like twenty bucks at, at Sam's Club. But um, how you know? Suppose my kid eats a couple pieces of chicken, um, and his meal plan. How do you uh, how do you use the R? Well, it's first of all in his meal plan. He's not just getting a couple of pieces of chicken. He's getting a weighed amount mm -hmm. or a reproducible amount. Right that he's getting every day, and he's getting a reproducible amount of carbohydrate that's kept relatively low, and uh, we'll, we'll start off with a guess as to how much regular to use for this meal. Now, I have formulas that I use that are fine for uh, people who don't have insulin resistance. Um, and the formulas are simple. Uh, a half unit of R covers one ounce of protein. And uh, one unit of R covers uh, about uh, eight grams of carbohydrate. Um, just let me think for a minute. Yeah. One unit of R, in theory, covers eight grams of carbo, and a half unit of R covers one ounce of protein. So when you have, you're starting your meal plan, your initial guess could be by total, doing the computations that I just made, and then make, maybe lowering it by 20% to play, play it safe, to be on the safe side. Chances are it'll be too low, but you see what happens to the blood sugars. And then you can increase the R the next day for those meals, uh, a half unit per meal or a unit per meal based upon how much you know that one unit will raise your blood sugar. Well, um, how do you know that? With a very obese individual who's insulin resistant or someone who's pregnant or a woman who's having her period next week, it's uh, really a guess as to how much one unit will lower blood sugar. But for a person who's not obese, for a kid who's not in, in the middle of a growth spurt, mm -hmm. um, uh, someone who weighs, um, let's say, 150 pounds, um, one unit of insulin will lower them about 40. Mm -hmm. That's an initial guess. Um, so here, after this meal, your blood sugar is running 40 higher than you would like it to be. The next time for that meal, you add one unit to the insulin. Mm -hmm. um, if you're running 20 higher, you add a half unit, etc. Mm -hmm. So it's plain and simple. It's the math is not complicated. Um, doctors don't want to even learn this. It's much easier. Yeah. To just take a lot of carbohydrate, a fast-acting insulin, and then close your eyes. Right. And throw the patient out there to take care of himself, or give him to a nurse educator or a dietitian, and let them worry about it. And uh, uh, if you've looked at Dietitians, most dietitians are overweight. Many of them are very obese. And uh, many of them are diabetic. And those who are diabetic are frequently taking large doses of insulin mm -hmm. to cover all the carbohydrate they're eating. My experience with my kid, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to advertise what you're saying is correct. The experience is that uh, we have his basils correct. He wakes up in the morning with normal blood sugars, right around 80. 
he has his breakfast and he does his shot of R and he goes to school and now he has a, a you know, he'll test before lunch, maybe twice. And his line is flat all day until lunch. And then at lunch, he does another dose. He eats a lunch. He eats a breakfast and lunch that he loves. So he's comfortable with the food. And then he's flat until he comes home. Uh, so he loves this because he wants to play at recess. He doesn't want to report to the nurse's office with a blood sugar of 400. Uh, he doesn't want to feel bad all day. He wants to live his life. So uh, the regimen that you're describing is it, it's not a set it and forget it. He still has to uh, do a finger prick and make sure. But if he needs to correct himself, he might do a half a tab of glucose, which he keeps in his pocket, not uh, sucking down juice boxes in a severe state of hypoglycemia. And if so, for some reason his blood sugar runs high, he takes a little bit of insulin and uh, he's back to normal. It's a totally different way of living uh, your life. It's like, it's like our life has been restored as a family. And uh, it's unfortunate that uh, neither the medical profession nor paramedical pro uh, professionals nor industry is really interested in the patient. Uh, outcomes like this are of no interest. Yeah. 